I'm here on June 20th in Marrakesh at the uh, negotiations on a treaty for copyright exceptions for people who are blind and have other disabilities. I'm talking to Joseph Farrell, who's a member of the Civil Society Coalition. Um, Joseph, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on how things have gone so far here? Well, the openings have been very interesting. They've had a, a um, very formal session where each country gets to put forward their views and then later in the day the NGOs get to put forward what they think. That is allowed to be reported on. After that they then go into secret negotiations in, in a basement, um, which is very interesting because the countries who have been quite obstructive to date have the most magnanimous of opening statements towards the blind. Um, America, who's pushed back hard on, on lots of issues, for example, even used a, a quote by Helen Keller, whereby um, he said something to the effect of Helen Keller said doors will only open if people have open hearts. Uh, it's interesting to note, as has been pointed out to me, that the US is the country that took the deaf out of this treaty and stopped audiovisual works. Um, so it's ironic considering Helen Keller was both deaf and blind. Um, but I, personally, I don't like these gag orders. I feel that they're able to go and negotiate completely contrary to what they purport in their opening statements. Um, and it feels like they're serving an industry rather than a constituent. And that's what happens when you have these negotiations in complete silence. And there's no need for it. Is there any restriction on the, uh, 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 I'm, as I understand it, that you were able to, and lobbyists were, for, for, for industries are, are permitted to actually listen to an audio of the close to negotiations, but they're not permitted to use it on social media, is that correct? Yeah, so you can, there's a live transcript, you can see it, you can hear it, um, but it's off the record. And that also creates problems, in my view, further down the line when something is litigated against. I mean, these treaties have become very powerful because countries have to implement them at some stage. And they're more likely to ratify it, they sign and ratify it. And um, to not be able to go back and look at a transcript or have some sort of open document as to how a particular country was hoping to implement something means that the reinterpretation becomes a lot more difficult. Um, I don't think that side of it is very not useful and it doesn't serve the public very well. It does serve the country who tends to follow the line of their industry, it seems. How do you feel that, uh, I mean, is, is there any restriction on the ability of a person working for a publisher or a motion picture company to report in their private channels of communication what each country is saying in the negotiation so they can then use the uh, the influence of the company to uh, push back on uh, on that country's position? Well, the, um, I mean, it, it looks like the industry and the, and the publisher, well, the publisher is the industry. Um, the publishers also have lobbyists, so this is, who aren't necessarily the publishers, they're just their lobbyists, and that's their bread and butter. So, I mean... What I mean is, is it, I mean, what, I, mean I, I think the way it's currently set up, is that the lobbyist for the publishers and, and, and us too we can actually hear what's going on in the closed session yeah they can report it to their people in the boardroom and corporate executives oh, and yes, things like that but we so, cannot re we cannot report it to the general public no so we can't report it to the general public they report it we can report it to our own groups obviously because they're there but our outlet is the media and the public their outlet is backdoor and revolving door. So they can report it to their CEOs. Their CEOs then have revolving door relationships or have been prior to where the, prior to being a CEO have been in the in, in in government itself. And so it does get reported back that way. So that's again why it's not particularly transparent and goes completely against my grain. It's very transparent at the corporate level, right? Well of course. <laughs> I mean, they, they have transparency, it's just the public doesn't have transparency, yeah. right? And you know, there's some very... I want to talk a bit about some of the um, NGO opening statements. There was a, a very, very emotive one by a South African delegate, also from the Civil Society Coalition, who um, is completely blind. And he spoke about how, without having this interoperability, which means being able to use documents on various, or books on whichever device 
one uses rather than lock it to a specific device. Because all these locks exist, when he was trying to quote some references, the only way that he was able to do that was by reading an entire page. So, and he wasn't able to, to copy or paste or anything like that. So he had to read the entire page to get to the references at the bottom and then type a bit. And then read the entire page again and then type a bit. And then again. And it took him about, God knows, two hours. He couldn't work out how to spell things. Um, and he, he gave this example and it doesn't seem to really... It was interesting because the country delegates that I spoke to subsequently um, found it very, very emotional. And they thought, this is very important. It's important there's somebody there who, against all the odds and all the barriers that are there, he's still fighting to do it. But the thing that they noted as well was that, as he said, he's from a middle class family. Um, he can afford to have a device, whereas some people can't at all. Um, and they, they recognized this as a real educational problem. Um, another NGO, um, the Transatlantic Group, made a very interesting comment for the publishers saying that this is their opportunity to legitimize copyright, to make this more of a treaty for the blind and make it accessible rather than something yet again to protect the publishers. This is coming from a person who's quite anti-copyright, he's copyright left. And he had a, a very valid point, this is a very, you know, even the publishers can get on board here and uh, do good for humanity or for the blind. Um, yeah, I mean, if you take some of the rough edges off the system, it becomes more acceptable to people. Yeah, and I mean, the, the publishing, as, as, this, as the Marcus said, the, the blind delegate, um, he said the publishing industry has failed him completely, absolutely completely. And then I was speaking to a visually impaired woman who works for, the, for an Australian rights group, and she said that she wants, she doesn't want to take away uh, the competitiveness of organizations who create audiobooks and braille and all the rest. She doesn't want to take the incentive away from them remaining in existence, and this treaty would. I was a bit speechless because I thought, you suffer. She suffers the same as I do. She has, we actually use the same viewing device, a monocular, that, you know, it's like a telescope. Um, we have the same one. So she suffers equally as I do, but it kind of shows that if you're a capitalist, you're a capitalist, irrespective of what you might be going through. And I just thought that she was promoting uh, yet another monopoly. What are the... Uh main issues that are dividing the delegates? The, um, there's, there's a lot to do with the interoperability, which is being able to use it on, on various devices. Uh, there's the fair use. Some people want to take, well, the publishers, that's not the delegates, but they want to take fair use out completely, which is going to really affect, especially small countries that don't have. Fair use allows an individual to go to a publisher or to go and ask for a, a copy. Um, so in a small country like Swaziland, for example, that doesn't have an authorized entity or a blind association, they have a delegate here, but he recognizes that they don't have the resources to have that. So taking fair use out will completely uh, scupper the whole system for, for all the blind people in small countries which are resource poor for blind people. Um, there's also um, I've forgotten the term now. Allowing it to be used across borders. Well, um, one, of, one of the things that I think is a challenge in this agreement is what the provisions will be that will allow a library of accessible works in one country to provide sure. works to an individual in another country. Well, this is part of the fair use and also, what is the, I can't remember the term. Oh. There'll be a lot uh, of like uh, <laughs> there are a lot of terms. There'll be a, you know, a lot of regulation of that activity going on here. There, and I there think will that, be. And I was very disappointed when I when I spoke to the South African delegate because yeah. I was I said you know Swaziland would rely on being able to share things across borders. Um, likewise, Lesotho or I mean I'm talking from my perspective, which is where I I suffered in these areas. And she said we mustn't confuse this this with trade agreements. You know, if you have that issue, go and speak to your country delegate. 
which I had already and I thought this is completely, um, this is a very patriotic view which is not dealing with blind, which is global. I was quite disappointed with that. But on the whole, I would like to say that within these negotiations that we were listening to yesterday, the ones that I'm not allowed to report on, um, I did, I was very proud to be African. I heard the Nigeria group and the Algeria and uh, Egypt and um, some other countries really, they, they were really pushing hard for a treaty that's really going to serve all the blind people. They were pushing back against the bullies of the European Union and America. And um, I mean, it got heated and I mean, it, it, the session was drawn to a close early because as uh, one delegate said, it is people's emotions and tempers are high. Um, but it was, it was really very reassuring to see how Africa is being a, a united front on this. Let, let me just ask you, for everything that you've heard this, this uh, the, the time you've been here, uh, by, ch by talking to delegates directly and uh, listening to the floor speeches and, and um, uh, reading the positions that people have taken, I, I'm, I'm from the United States of America. What do you think the role of the Obama administration is so far in this treaty negotiation? Just speaking at, at, at a high level, looking at the forest, not the trees. The, um, you know, America's, America serves its blind community very, very well. Um, it offers a lot for people within its borders, but they're not really willing to uh, share that across borders. And I kind of feel that's, is that not what America's always been about, partly? It's, it's about us, not, not the world, or about us conquering the world. Um, I mean, it's appalling when you see things that they allow within their own laws, and when it comes to these transnational negotiations for, for citizens of the world, so to speak, it, it doesn't apply. It's disappointing. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. And especially, it's also disappointing because they have a huge, huge right. library, which they could easily allow, you know, lots of people who are visually impaired to, to share in. Uh, Joseph, is there anything else you'd like to add? No. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for uh, being in Marrakesh and for following this uh, negotiation. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. <laughs>